and we'll get into all of that on future episodes, but we have one kind of final topic to put a bow on all of these different coaching discussions and everything that we've had to discuss. Brady versus Dorsey. It's a topic that I think we need to revisit. I would say we'll probably revisit it during the season, uh, but one last time here. Dorsey goes to Cleveland to now back with uh, back up, basically be the backup to Kevin Stefanski in Cleveland. Uh, and he signed, uh, you know, we'll see what he's able to do as a quarterback coach slash non-play caller at this moment. Maybe his best role for Watson and will they have Flacco back there and whatever Kevin Stefanski is going to do. So we need to compare that and, and we'll, we'll see how that unfolds as 2024 unfolds. But more importantly, how does it relate to Brady and what the Bills offense did under Brady and what was different? Why were the Bills able to look more efficient, you know, essentially rail off seven wins uh, I thought they looked pretty good in both playoff games for the most part. The fourth quarter was a little lackluster, uh, but still they were they were pretty successful minus a couple drops. So, Kevin, let's get us started. I know a, a topic you wanted to discuss, so get into it a little bit with uh, Brady versus Dorsey. Well, I don't want to say that I was a Ken Dorsey hater because I tried to look at both sides for everything. I know I talked about that with Bean McDermott, but I was trying to do the same thing as you probably remember – where I said, look, it's Dorsey's fault, but you also have to blame Josh Allen for some things too because Josh Allen is not perfect. But I leaned more on the side of anti-Dorsey just because some of the things that he was doing was just so mind-boggling where it, it legit seemed like he was running an offense on Madden. I know it was a joke on Twitter, but sometimes his routes were literally the four verticals that you see on Madden. And it was so infuriating because... There was no creativity, no motion, no pre-snap motion. They weren't using Josh Allen to his strengths. There wasn't any play action. And the way that the Bills lost last year to Cincinnati, I said, look, I know they were decimated with injuries, the whole DeMar Hamlin thing that happened, but this team was not going to win because they got outcoached. They could have had a fully healthy roster, and they got outcoached defensively and offensively, and I thought the game plan was terrible. So I was willing to give them the benefit of the doubt, and I said, okay, let's just regroup and try to come back together this year. And you could just see how slow and lethargic that the Bills offense was. I mean, look at all those memes where Josh Allen had the long hair and he just looked so distraught. And, you know, he was talking about that low positive energy and trying to find himself. And then the moment they fire Ken Dorsey, he's on the sideline saying, I feel like I'm back. And right then and there, you could just see that energy, and Sean McDermott talked about it too, just the different vibes and the, the the mojo that this offense finally had. I mean, Josh Allen is the dude. Let him be the dude. And I know Ken Dorsey did, as we'll get into the, some of the numbers here, but I just don't think that Dorsey played to Allen's strengths, and the offense was just way too simplistic, way too vanilla. There wasn't enough creativity. And if I'm a defensive coordinator, it was very easy to game plan on the Buffalo Bills prior to them firing Ken Dorsey. You know, for me, I saw the light at the end of the tunnel. Some of the, you know, he put a masterpiece together against Miami and three straight 25 plus point wins. Um, I mean, it was looking like this was silly talk to be here in January talking about this discussion. Um, but Teams knew what he was going to do. There, there it is. Like he had no creativity. And I think the word that you should use, he didn't stack. Um, there was a lot of things that he did well. And in a perfect world, his offense was great. Uh, and unfortunately, when you're playing Robert Sala, who's, you know, may have his issues um, when you're playing Bill Belichick, whose team may have their issues uh, now, not a coach. Um, when you play other, you know, even Mike Vrabel's of the world and to some extent, other coaches and other staffs, it's not the perfect world. And unfortunately, the right call wasn't made at all the times. Patrick P Peterson in the uh, overtime thriller against the Vikings last year famously said, they're predictable. I knew what offense they were running. I knew where Gabe Davis was going. And more importantly, there was no spacing. You had Isaiah McKenzie doing, I don't know what, uh, dragging his dragging Peterson into Gabe Davis, where there was no option on that play other than Josh to throw it away. Because otherwise, the only one that he could try to fit into was Gabe Davis. And we saw the result of that in overtime. Not really dwelling on one specific play that's strange. But that's just an example of some of the issues that we saw with stacking. You saw guys open on the sideline uh, with no one in the middle of the field. Hence why they went with Dalton Kincaid and said that would fix it. Uh, Dalton Kincaid's a middle of the field type of player. He's got great hands. He can win contested catches. And we saw that. 
from Dalton Kincaid this season, but that's what they decided to do. They decided to change their personnel in order to get efficient on offense. You saw, you saw passing out of 12 because it was more efficient uh, to get Josh Allen options out of 12 personnel. And you saw running out of 11 because it got a shallow box. Uh, So those are the kind of things that you saw. And it wasn't very creative. It was just a situation of we have 11 personnel. They're playing us for the pass. We're going to run the ball. That was Ken Dorsey. We're in 12 personnel. You don't know quite what we're going to do. Uh, we're going to throw pretty well out of this, but our run, we couldn't run out of it at all um, out of 12. And he just stopped running the ball because of it. He wanted to be in 12 because they passed efficiently in it. And we couldn't run out of 12. That was the biggest issue that I saw. Um, and eventually leading to a situation where Josh Allen leads the team down the field, goes ahead on a nice rushing touchdown to take the lead against Denver. And beside that specific drive, that offense was terrible. They were down eight points the majority of the day to Denver, uh, leading to you know people talking about more than just Dorsey to to McDermott. But you saw what able what was able to do um, with a more efficient offense, Kevin. So ultimately, he's going to be able to put his wrinkle on it. He's going to be able to probably get the first top receiver in the draft that this offense has seen. Uh, Brian Dable, I guess, got Stephon Diggs. Ken Dorsey kind of just inherited some pieces, but did get Dalton Kincaid. Now you're going to get Brady, who's going to be able to stack some of the things that work with Dorsey, stack some of his own plays that work this season, stack his running game. He has a fully efficient offensive line that they're not going to need to touch. He's going to bring back Diggs uh, and Khalil Shakira, who's now entrenched, and Dalton Kincaid and Dawson Knox, who's got a bunch of pieces already that teams would love to have. And now he's going to get added a a big-time vet free agent, maybe a medium-tier vet free agent, and a top-end rookie. I mean, he's going to be given certain players for his offense, which, you know, at the end of the day, you might be able to say, well, it just didn't work for Doris. I mean, look at the difference that Brady, I mean, Brady's going to be given a way more efficient uh, pieces. Do you subscribe to that, that he only got, like, let's be honest, he got a year and a half. Like, the Bills, that's how much the Bills needed to win. And some of the metrics that we have on it basically just state they were unlucky and no one wants to hear it. Um, because some of the ugly play designs, but where, where, where do you fit in this whole debate? Do you think that at the end of the day, you give Brady some of the things I just talked about? Can this offense take it to the next level? Cause they were flirting with four to six all year based on what metric you used. Oh, for sure. And I think that's a perfect segue into the stats that I have because I found these today and it is just so interesting when you see these together. So look at these numbers between Joe Brady and Ken Dorsey. I'm not going to read all of them here because you can see them, but they are very, very similar. And the three most important, they're at the top. I mean, these are including the two playoff games. So 10 games with Dorsey, nine with Brady. The Bills averaged 26.2 points with Dorsey, just over 27 with Brady. And then also with Brady, they averaged, what, eight more yards than with Dorsey? Very, very similar touchdowns. They had more with Dorsey than with Brady, but the key is at the end, the turnovers, 18 turnovers with Ken Dorsey, only nine with Brady. And I think this kind of transitions us into what I wanted to say about Joe Brady, because the other key stat right there is the rushing yards. And you alluded to this, Kevin, 161.2 rushing yards per game under Joe Brady, only 116.5 with Ken Dorsey. So I think that is the key difference right there. When you have Ken Dorsey, who called 64% of the plays were passing plays, only 36% of the time they were running. And then you go to Joe Brady, he called a passing play on 54% of the plays, and then runs were 46%. So he was very well balanced. And I think that was what the Bills needed. Because then you could see how they would milk out these long, sustaining drives. And then they would play that complimentary football that McDermott always talks about. And one of the key games was in Los Angeles when they had to run the clock out. Or maybe even a better example against Dallas. They just ground and pound all day. And that's how they beat the Cowboys. Josh Allen really didn't have to do that much because it was James Cook show. And then I know Josh Allen had to do a little bit more against the Chargers. But again, I just remember those long sustaining drives and then they turn it over to the defense, let them do the job, game over. And they even went on those long sustaining drives against Kansas City. I like the game plan. It's just they didn't execute in the end. So I think that's the biggest difference right there. When Joe Brady took over, he started to utilize his running backs. He started to throw to James Cook. He knew how to use Ty Johnson. 
or Latavius Murray or Leonard Fournette when he was in. Khalil Shakir, if you look at his numbers, Shakir skyrocketed after Joe Brady took over. He was essentially a nobody before. Same with Dalton Kincaid. Now, I know he had some good games under Ken Dorsey, but for the first five or six weeks of the year, we were like, really? You traded up to get this guy, and now you don't know how to use him? So he took off after Joe Brady took over. So I think that is my biggest takeaway right there. That was like the definition of the argument. When Ken Dorsey was such a polarizing figure here, people kept pointing to the numbers and the DVOA, the EP, like all this stuff. And well, the numbers are there. Look at they're they're averaging 370 yards per game and they, they're scoring 30 touchdowns and 26 points per game. W- what more do you want? Well, I want you to understand how to use the, the players that are on your roster. And I want you to understand how to throw to your running backs and try to get everyone involved. And I think that's what Joe Brady did. And to your point, he has a full off season to put his own wrinkles into it. You would think that Brandon Bean is going to build up the wide receiver room for him. You run it back with the same offensive line. You have Josh Allen again. Hopefully he's going to be 100% healthy with that shoulder. And I am feeling very good about this Joe Brady hire. I'll say some circumstances worked in his favor. The turnovers is not – Ken Dorsey didn't say, go, Josh Allen, go turn the ball over. Um, yes, you can say, well, they ran 11 and a half times more per game. That's going to reduce your turnovers. In theory, you're not throwing the ball as much. That means you're not trusting Josh Allen, though. You're saying it's a Josh Allen problem, which it's not. Ultimately, there is some luck factor in some of this. He had very limited and turnover-worthy plays, and, and unfortunately, some didn't go his way. Um, so you can point directly to the 9 and 18 down there and say, well – I mean, it's just the way it crumbled as crunch time happened and Josh Allen cleaned some stuff up himself and some execution came. He started to 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 get better as the season went on. You know, would that have happened under Dorsey? There's no way to know. So in his defense, uh, we don't know what would have happened in that turnover margin in the second half of the season anyways. But, uh, you know, we didn't need to find out, I guess. So we don't really need to know uh, how and, lucky or unlucky that is. And that's the point that I was trying to make where you have to look at it from both sides and say, Did Ken Dorsey turn the ball over? No, it was Josh. But did he put his players in the best position for Josh to make a throw? And that's where it comes back. And you have to have that nuanced conversation here and that nuanced thinking. Because to your point about Patrick Peterson saying, I knew where it was going because Gabe Davis only runs the same three routes. And to your other point about how there was just no spacing with Ken Dorsey's offense. Well, when you make Josh Allen try to fit in these tight windows and say, we're going to be smart and conservative you essentially want to just hit the gas pedal and say, go, go, go. And they both had that quarterback mindset where it's like, we want to throw all over these teams. That is why you start to see more of these turnovers. Now I will say, if you look at Stefan Diggs, I'll say something good about uh, Dorsey here. Cause I don't want to seem like I'm just ragging on him the whole time. Diggs's numbers were great under Dorsey. And then they totally tailed off with Joe Brady. So I think that is going to be one of the main things that Brady has to work on is, understanding how to involve Stefan Diggs more. And they, they went with that wide receiver screen a lot. I don't like that. I think Diggs is best in the intermediate routes, 10, 15, 20 yard routes. You go get a speed demon who can take the top off the defense and that will make the wide receiver room very well yeah, that, rounded. That wasn't my favorite um, part of Brady is his, his, his use of his receiver one. Uh, other than that, I thought he was ideal. I thought Dorsey's definitely better at his receiver one, but ultimately, um, you know, obviously Brady, the turnovers were down. He could run the ball better, but he's, it, it is what it is. He's going to get a situation now to where he's going to get the best of Dorsey and his playbook, the best of Dable and the best of the Bills players. Like he's going to have a full offensive line that has started the most games together in the league. Um, now they were the only team, I believe, at the, by the end of the season to play all every snap together. Osiris Torrance took every snap of the season. Uh, you have an entrenched five. My whole thing is you're going to bring back all nine of them. I want Ryan, Ryan Vandemark. I want a David Edwards contract like now. He is a useful seventh, uh, sixth or seventh offensive lineman. Uh, very much do not feel bad if he has to step in for uh, a, a game or a series. Uh, super well as a sixth offensive lineman. He is a solid offensive lineman. We'll see if he goes and gets paid um, or if people, if only the Bills view him as the sixth offensive lineman. But Vandemark, Bates, uh and alec anderson i don't want to touch anything i don't want to need to touch that maybe take a guy in the last round or udfas but i don't need to want to touch that that's so such a benefit to not have and same into this discussion the same thing for for brady he doesn't need to worry about anything when it comes to yes it's not the number one line but they flirted 
with the number one pass line. They flirted with top 10 run blocking line. Uh, that's a nice bonus to not have to worry at all, as stressed at all about as an offensive coordinator, which Dorsey did. He had a hurt right tackle. Uh, he didn't get anything from Roger Saffold. So you definitely had to worry about some of the offensive line issues uh, in his tenure that Brady is now not having to worry about uh, into his situation. And he's also going to get a more developed James Cook, a more developed Dalton Kincaid, a healthy Dawson Knox, and into the system Khalil Shakir. He can think about all offseason how he's going to use Stephon Diggs. And he's going to be adding another receiver bat that he picks and probably a high-end rookie. So what a situation to be in uh, for Brady. And it just fell in. Sometimes life is about this, Kevin. It just falls into place for you. You take the best of all those situations. You have the best personnel. You have a good O-line. I mean, it may just be a perfect scenario. But if it fits that well, he ain't going to be around here long because all the coaches that had to get hired this year, he already interviewed for a coach this year, reminded me of Dable. And now a situation to where all that's left really is Ben Johnson, who didn't get a didn't get a didn't get a position. Five defensive play, uh, coaches uh, got got already plucked. So I mean, I mean, right now the situation be the Bills may to the whole theme of the show, the Bills may have two young coordinators who may be very much so on the path to be head coaches. So if he does as well as I think he may do with his personnel, as 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 referring to uh, to Dorsey, uh, excuse me, Brady. Um, Maybe the Bills don't see him next year at the end of the year anyways. So that was always going to be the risk with that situation. And good luck to Dorsey. Ultimately, he's with the Browns. Maybe he's in a better situation to where Stefanski's going to be calling the plays. He's going to have the opportunity to work with Deshaun Watson. I went on a Browns podcast yesterday talking about the strengths and weaknesses of Dorsey. And I said, look, if he doesn't have to call plays, Stefanski can be there, help, help him out with stacking and a couple of other concepts. I could see a situation to where the reason he got the job in the first place was some of the things he's strong at. So best of luck to, to we'll, we'll be following that. And then another topic came up, Kevin, will they sign Gabe Davis? Uh, because hmm. Dorsey seemed to really like him and know how to use him. Um, and he's a good at willing run blocker. We all know all the pros. Um, will he or Dable, I guess either, or will they be in situation? I do think that there's a possibility he could wind up, uh, as a receiver in either of those situations, how funny would it be to track Dorsey and Davis uh, in Cleveland? And maybe we'll have something to talk about uh, this off season. Well, does Deshaun Watson like post routes? Because if he does get ready for a lot of those, they all Ken pointed, Dorsey they did. They Davis. pointed to Will Fuller uh, as a, as a, as a situation. So, you know, the, the Will Fuller and Deandre Hopkins scenario, um, you know, so we'll see if that matters with Cooper and Gabe Davis. Uh, that, so we'll that see would how be, that looks. Yeah. yeah, that'd be very interesting. Like you said, best of luck to Ken Dorsey. I know I was hard on him, as were a lot of fans, but rightfully so, because when you were given the keys to a Ferrari, he didn't crash it, but he also didn't maintain his uh, composure on the road that well, if you know what I mean. So he definitely deserves some criticism. But at the same time, like you said, if Stefanski's there to help him call the plays, it could be a similar situation like McDermott and Babbage, like we talked about at the beginning of the show tonight. It could be kind of like a dual threat, you know, a two-headed monster, if you will. Maybe it's the same thing with uh, Cleveland, with Stefanski and Dorsey. Maybe that's what he needs to get back on his feet. Maybe there was a little bit too much pressure, and Stefanski said, look, I'm calling the plays, but you can help me design them, and we're going to help you get back on your feet because we know you, you took a lot of flack in Buffalo. Your numbers were good. You had a great offense. And, you know, something else we didn't mention was, you know, a lot of people could say, well, he had Josh Allen to cover up his numbers and all of his shortcomings. So this could be the right move career-wise for Ken Dorsey. So that being said, best of luck to him. And, of course, best of luck to Joe Brady.